We're continuing our series on minefields, on minefields. And you know, friends, if you think about it, there are today many spiritual minefields that are abounding us, all around us. And these landmines are there to make sure that we trip up, that we fail, we, we fall into them. We need to learn to avoid them. The Word of God gives us warnings, tells us to be alert, tells us to be on the lookout, because whether, whether you like it or not, you might be already deceitfully falling into this trap of a landmine. In the few past weeks that we had in discussing landmines, we talked about consequences. Choices have consequences. Therefore, assume responsibility. All your choices make a difference. We talked about immorality. Immorality might seem to some people inconsequential. It's just, it's just my life. I do with it what I want. But you know, friends, it affects so many other people. Flee immorality. That's the key. Flee from immorality. We talked about wrong addictions, habits, vices, uh, gaming, uh, gambling, all kinds of addictions that you cannot let go of. Friends, you need to replace it with Jesus. If you have not heard these messages, I encourage you to go to YouTube, go to the CCF Alabang site, and just uh, look them up, and they're all there for you. We talked about immediatitis, people who can't wait. They want it now. They want it now, and we learned that it's waiting on the Lord. That's the key, waiting on the Lord. And then don't quit. If you feel like giving up, if you feel like throwing in the towel saying, I, I don't like to continue this Christian life, friends, don't quit. Hupomeno, never give up. Never give up. Last week we talked about complainitis. Complainitis. And I hope this past week you've had a, a chance to hear yourself. Did you complain a lot this past week? Okay. I don't know if that's a good point or not, but I trust that you're, you're not complaining as much. Complainitis, trust in the Lord. We're going to talk about a very dangerous hidden landmine that involves all of us, and it has to do with money. It has to do with money. Money is amazing. Did you know that money has a lot of different names? Did you know that? You didn't know that, huh? Well, can I test you? I'm going to test you to see how many names of money you know. For example, in church, it's called what? Very good. It's called tithe. Yes. Well, in school, it's called? Tuition. Yes. Or baon. Yes. In marriage, it's called? In marriage, it's called? It's called? Well, you know, in our culture, not so much. But in, in some cultures, it's called dowry. Okay? Okay. You give a dowry, a down payment <laughs> to be engaged to a woman. If they accept your dowry, okay, if not, you know, you're rejected. In divorce, it's called freedom. Who said freedom? Huh? <laughs> it's called alimony. Yes, alimony. When, you're, when you owe someone, it's a, it's a debt. Yes, it's a debt. In court, it's settlement. Yes. What else? It's penalty. It's fines, right? Now, I don't know if it's fine, but it's fines, okay? It's fines. When you pay the government, it's a crime. Who said a crime? <laughs> it's not a crime. It's tax, okay? When you pay the government, it's tax. Civil servant retirees, it's pension. pension. Yes. There's so many names for money. Did you realize that? What about employer to workers? It's so You can't forget that. That's your salary every, what, half month, full month. To children, it's... It's, you know, some kids say it's a right. It's not a right. It's allowance. Okay, it's allowance. When you borrow from the bank, it's, it's a loan. When you give after good service, it's, it's a tip. Yes, it's a tip. 10% service charge. To kidnappers, it's called ransom. Yes, ransom. Illegally received in the name of service, it's called a? It's called a bribe. In Tagalog? Suhol. Ano pa? Lagay. Ano pa? In Tagalog? Under the table. <laughs> okay. How about this? When a husband gives money to his wife, what do we call it? Huh? Come on, guys. Husbands, you know this. When you give money to your wife, it's called? It's called duty. It's good. Husbands, it's your duty. Now, husbands, don't ever forget this because you know your wives are not duty-free. They are not duty-free, okay? Let me just say this right from the beginning. There's nothing wrong with money. 
Okay, there's nothing wrong with money. As a matter of fact, you need money to live. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Now, if God blesses you and you get rich and you have a lot of money, it's okay because you work hard for it. Hopefully, you work hard for it. You're honest in receiving it, in earning for it. You work with excellence. It's okay. It might not be okay if you, if you receive that money uh, dishonestly, cheating, okay? But if you work hard with excellence, it's okay to have a lot of money and, and even to enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with saving your money, nothing wrong with investing your money, or even uh, setting aside money for your retirement. That's, that's fine. Now, nothing wrong with living within your budget. Do you guys live within your budget? Some people say, what's a budget? What's a budget? Nothing wrong making money as long as you're not printing it. That's okay, all right? Jesus had a lot to say about money. As a matter of fact, in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 15, look what he says. Let's read this together. And he, Jesus, everyone, said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of what? In the abundance of the things he possesses. These are Jesus' words to us. He says, Life does not consist of the abundance of the things he possesses. Beware of what? Covetousness. The title of our message, it's Beware of Covetitis. Be content. Can you all say that? Is that the very first time you hear the word covetitis? It's because I made it up. Huh? But it's, it's a word which describes the spiritual disease of covetousness. That's what it is. We're going to look at three aspects tonight to understand all about this and to really protect ourselves because that's what we need. Every one of us needs protection. We need warning. We need alert. So we need to be ready. Three points. The very first point is the practice of covetitis. And then we're going to look at the penalty of covetitis. And finally, the prescription of covetitis, how to get out of it. Are you ready to do the first one? Are you all ready? Okay, the first one, practice of covetitis. I heard a story about this airline pilot who was flying over this, this area, and he saw a little lake below. And he told his co-pilot, he says, you know, when I was small, I used to go fishing in a rowboat in that little lake. And when I was a little boy, I looked up in the sky, and I saw airplanes pass, and I would say to myself, oh, one day I wish I was a pilot flying that plane. He told his co-pilot, you know, today I look down, and I wish I was a little boy on the rowboat fishing. It's just like us today. We look up and we say, oh, I wish I was married. Lord, I wish I was married. And people up, that, up there say, oh, I wish I was single again. <laughs> what is it with us? Huh? What is it with us? Webster defines covetousness like this. Feeling or showing a very strong desire for something that you do not have. It goes on to say that you, that you do not have especially for something that belongs to someone else, okay? A strong desire for something you do not have, especially for things that belong to someone else. I would say when, when it's not God's will for you to have something, that is when you are being covetous, okay? Now, covetitis is a spiritual sickness. Why do we say that? It's the spiritual sickness of deceitful dissatisfaction of what you have compared to others. You deceive yourself you're dissatisfied, you are comparing yourself to others. It leads to a consuming, selfish desire for more money, material things, image, status, and even people that you're willing to gain by com compromising your faith in God. That last phrase is key here. It says, by compromising your faith in God. It's a spiritual cancer because, friends, when we lust after something, that lust somehow changes the place of God in our lives. It becomes what we really desire. More than God, we put that thing, whatever that thing, that person, that, that item over God, and it becomes idolatry. And that's why it's a spiritual cancer. Our covetousness rears its ugly head. Today, if you look around at the marriage statistics, how many people are getting divorced, separated, it's because they're selfish within. They don't want to change. They don't want to give in to their marriages and, and adjust. And, and because of that, they just quit. They give up. They look for someone else, and they get remarried. And what's the, what happens later? They discover that they go through the same old problems that they had in their very first marriage. People are never satisfied. Now, this is one sin that in all my 30 years of ministry, I've never heard people confess. 
No one's coming up to me and says, oh, pastor, I want to confess I've got the sin of covetousness. I'm greedy. I'm envious. Things like, no, people don't say that. Have you heard anyone say that? What about you? Can you tell your neighbor, ask your neighbor, are you covetous? Is there something in your life today? Is there something in your life today that you really, really desire? That you really desire? Let me ask you a question. What is do not covet in Tagalog? What is do not covet in Tagalog? You don't know, huh? It's wag kang magkabit. Wag kang magkabit. You know, kabit, mistress. Don't have a mistress also. That's not, that's not right. Okay? Now, the real, the real word for covet is masakim. Can you all say that? Masakim or pagimbot. Uh, ambot? I don't know, huh? <laughs> Whatever. The street language for, for covetous is buaya. Diba? Buaya. If you want to be social about it, you call them lakos, mga lakos. Uh, oh, the things we say, huh? Well, are you today covetous? What's the title of our message again? The title is, Beware of Covetitis, Be Content. Be Content. I'll be honest with you, this is one sin that I truly struggled with in my life. As I was growing up, for some reason, I had an insecurity that I wanted to make sure that I was taken care of. I, I took care of myself. I, I wanted to make sure that I was rich, that I was wealthy, that I had enough money to, to take care of myself. That's, that's my fear. And I grew up striving to earn money. That was my goal. At the age of 15, I wanted to be a, a millionaire before 30. Have you had that thought? I want to make a million pesos before I become 30. And I strived hard. I worked hard, persevered until I got to 26 years old and I became a millionaire. I really worked hard. And when I reached that that level, I thought in my heart that I would be satisfied. I thought the, the money would give me satisfaction, friends, happiness, joy. I could buy all these things. And, and yeah, I was able to buy things, accumulate things. But deep inside, and this is what was scary, deep inside I had this emptiness, thinking, is this it? Is this all there is to, to money? It, just, it didn't bring me satisfaction. It did not bring me peace. It, it just made me think, what's the meaning of life? And this is when I started questioning, and it came to a point where I, I discovered Jesus in that time. And Jesus changed my life. But I still need to be aware that I can fall into this sin anytime. I have to be on the alert that, that I can go back into this, this covetous sin anytime. Now, I believe that today so many people are in this sin, but they don't even know it. So the question is, how do you know if you're falling into the sin of covetitis today, how do you know? What are the characteristics? What's the evidence? Well, for one thing, you always want more. You're never satisfied with what you have. When you want something and you get it, you want more. You constantly want more. It's never a point of satisfaction. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, and the richest man as well, he wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. Let's all read this together. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. Can you imagine a man who could afford anything? He could buy whatever he wants in life. He could afford everything. And yet he says money is never enough. It's all meaningless. It's all meaningless. Coveting is sinful when you want something so badly that... What does it say? You're willing to compromise your faith in God to get it. You're willing to compromise your faith. So you're walking as a Christian, but you have this, this wonderful business deal, this contract that you can get, but you know that you have to compromise. You have to, you know, under the table, twist things around in order to get it. But you know that if you get that deal, it'll set you for life. It'll give you your retirement. And it's tempting. It really is tempting. And you're looking around and everyone else does it. What are you to do? Are you to say... You know, just this one time, Lord, just this one time, oh, friends, don't ever fall into that trap of this one time only. It could ruin your life, and I'll tell you about that in a while. Some people, you have the preoccupation with obtaining stuff, love to obtain stuff. You know, when you go to a, a shopping mall and you see something that you like so much in different colors, you don't make it a problem to choose which color you like. You just buy it all. Huh? You buy it all. You bring it home and you come home with all your shopping. And you look, is my husband there? Is my wife there? 
and you don't bring it down into the house because you don't want to show your spouse. So you keep it in the car, and you wait till they leave, and then you run into the house, and, and you bring all your stuff inside, take out the receipts, and cut it up, and, and throw away the bag so it doesn't appear that you brought anything new, obtaining stuff. What else? You're always envious of what others have. As long as you keep looking around, I wish I had his wife or his, her husband. I wish I had children like theirs, you know. We oftentimes compare. If I could only have that car, you know, or that home, or, or go to that trip, all these things. Another reason why coveting is sinful is when you're consumed, consumed with worldly pursuits that have no time, that you have no time to serve God. Think about this. You treat your life as if you're the only person that's important. And serving God to serve others is not even on your list. It's not even a priority. You don't even think about it. All you want to do is just enjoy life for yourself. Yes, nothing wrong with that, but at the end of your life, you'll say, what? What did I live for? Is that it? Is that all there is to it? Think about that. Another reason why you cannot serve the Lord is maybe because you're baun sa utang. You're in debt. You're buried under debt. And because of the debt that you have, you can't serve God because you've got to work. You've got to slave away to earn money to pay those debts. Why did you get into debt in the first place? Because you chose not to wait on God to give you the cash to pay for that item. Because you couldn't wait, you said, Lord, well, you didn't even say, Lord, you just said, I just want to go ahead and buy it. And so you used your credit card. And then you are more focused in providing for your children materially that you fail to provide for them spiritually. Right? What can I give my kids? iPod, iPad, iPad. What do you give your kids? Is it, is it material things or is it spiritual things? And this one also as well. You love things and use people instead of loving people and using things. This is so dangerous because we value things more than people. That's, that's out of place. These one parents, they gave their child an umbrella. Use this umbrella to school. It's rainy season. The child came back from school and, and did not have the umbrella. And the parents said, where did you put the umbrella? Oh, Dad, I don't know. I, I think I, I left it. I lost it. Someone got, I don't know. And the parents just scolded that child, just really got mad and angry to that child. The child's spirit was just crushed over an umbrella. Hello. It's just an umbrella. Replace the umbrella. Tell the child to be responsible. Don't lose the umbrella. Take care of it. They said, but don't ruin them. Don't ruin their spirit. It affects a person. You lend your child the, the car, and, and the, car, the child brings the car to school. It's responsible using it, but then parks it in the place, and, and it gets into an accident. Someone bumps it. It's not the child's fault, but when the child comes home with the car, you say, never, you're never going to use the car again. It's a car. You know, things happen. These are things. Love people and use things. Don't love things and use people. My friends, the reality is we are all, we're all covetous, one way or another. People love to gamble to make fast money. People like to work on Sundays just in order to earn even more. People like to buy expensive watches, but isn't it that all watches tell the same time? I, I, you know, I thought of that. They tell all the same time anyway. Well, what is it? Tell me, what is it about money? Money is important, and money brings a certain sense of joy. Would you agree? But why is it that money does not give us lasting happiness? Why is it that money doesn't give us this lasting happiness? joy. And I'll tell you the reason. The reason is because you and I have been created to have a fellowship with God. And through that fellowship, through that intimate fellowship with God, that's where we receive our true peace, our true joy. Not in what we think that money will give us, but in that personal relationship with God. That's what will give us the joy. Christ taught us. He taught us about how we should have the right heart attitude, because that's what it's about, your heart attitude he said in Luke 12, 15, a man's life consists not in the abundance of his possessions. What's he saying here? He's simply saying your self-worth, your self-worth is not equal to your net worth. Don't ever think that what you own, the value of everything you own is what you're worth. No. It's you. You are what, what's precious. You're valuable in God's sight. It's your self-worth. That's more precious than all the, all the money value that you have. 
some people strive and, and hope one day I can be in the, in the top Fortune 500, the list of the richest men, you know, of the Philippines, of Asia, of, of the U.S., of the world. And people strive for that. But you know what? If you're not on that list, so what? Big deal. It doesn't mean that you're not prestigious. It doesn't mean that you're not accomplished. It doesn't mean that you're not precious. You know, friends, but it does mean that you should. You should always plan. You should always strive. You should always look into ambition to provide for your family. Don't ever set that aside. We should continue to do that all the time. But you should understand that your life is defined by what you live for, not by what you own. Your life is defined by what you live for, not by, not by what you own. So let's look at our lives. If today you looked at that list and you see that you're guilty, you're guilty of being covetous. Friends, don't feel foolish. Don't feel foolish. It's foolishness if you don't do anything about it and you continue on with this type of life. That's what's foolish. Let's look at the penalty, the penalty of covetitis. In the time of Jesus, he gave a parable. This parable was about a rich man who owned a property. And let, let's read it together. It says there, the land of a rich man was very productive. He thought to himself, and he began reasoning to himself, saying, everyone, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? This man had a mega harvest, so much harvest that he didn't know where to put the, the produce. So what did he do? Verse 18 goes on, everyone. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. He had a solution to what he would do. Well, verse 19, he continues and says, I will say to my soul, he's talking to his soul, everyone, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That's where the phrase comes from. You heard people say, eat, drink, and be merry. That's where it comes from, this parable of this man. So based on what this guy says, what does Jesus say? What does Jesus reply? In verse 20, but God said to him, Jesus was recounting this, God said to him, you, what did he call him? You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? In other words, wake up, wake up, because anytime you can be taken away, you can go, You're, you can have your last breath on this earth. Do you know when that is? We don't know. But through this parable, Jesus gives us very simple, clear, moral precepts to learn. And what are those things? Jesus is not condemning business success. He's not condemning business success. He is not against planning for the future. Jesus does not criticize expanding your property. He's not saying it's wrong to enjoy life. Jesus is not suggesting that rich people shouldn't get richer. He's not condemning prosperity. Look at these things. That's, how, well, that's Jesus' point of view. He's not condemning, pro expanding, getting richer, etc. But what is it that the rich man did? For God to call him a fool. Because I know that you and I don't want to be called fools on the day that we see him face to face. We don't want to be called fools. But what did this rich man do for God to call him a fool? You know the answer is? This man acted selfishly without any concern for God or others. And that's why he was called a fool. Look at verse 21. It says there, This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not, what? Rich toward God. That's the answer. This man was not rich towards God. You know what that means? What does it mean to be rich towards God? First and foremost, his soul, he was spiritually bankrupt. He didn't have this connection with God. He, you can see that he didn't even consider God in his whole life. He was rich towards himself. He was rich towards himself, but he was not rich towards God. Today, are you rich towards God? First and foremost, do you have a special relationship with Him? I'm not just talking about, you know, those prayers that you throw up once in a while during meals and during crises and emergencies. God, help me. God, thank you. No, I'm talking about every day. A real 
personal, intimate relationship. And you know if you have it or not. I don't have to tell you. You know if you have that relationship. That is being rich towards God. That rich relationship. Another way to be rich is by having a life that reflects God in what you do and what you say, where you go. You, you live an example. You live a model life that, that shows what Christ is all about to others. You put God as a priority in your life. You seek first His kingdom and His righteousness in your life. You make decisions based on asking God, Lord, what should I do? Lord, how should I do this? Lord, what should I say? That is being rich towards God. Are you with me? And that's what this man needed. He needed to be rich towards God. God blessed him in order to be a blessing to others. Friends, let me, let me do a little self-examination, okay? Let me ask you, if you, for some reason, okay, received and won the $1 million Reader's Digest Sweepstakes Lottery, what would you do with it? What would you do with it? Would you think about all the things you could buy, all the places you could go, all the things you could travel and, and things that you could uh, afford, maybe put aside, aside some money for a retirement? Would you think about building a bigger house and buy more cars, traveling, moving to another country? What would you do? Or would you ask yourself, God, thank you for this $1 million. What do you want me to do with it? It comes from you. What do you want me to do with it? You see the difference? It's a big difference. Big, big difference. The man in the parable didn't even stop to consider that God gave him that mega harvest. And God wanted to use this man to be a blessing to others. All he thought about was, this is all for my benefit, the selfish, self-centered benefit. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, it says there, but those who want to get rich, what happens? Fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Friends, if you're covetous, you want to be rich, compromising your faith, doing things your way apart from God, it's like a trap. It's like a snare. It's there, and you might step on it. And if you do, it's going to turn your life upside down. It's going to ruin you. It's going to lead to destruction. It's going to tear your life apart. Be careful of this. Covetousness wants to capture your heart. In verse 10, it tells us there, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Continue. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. People say money is the root of all evil. Is that right? No. It's the love of money. It's the, the unchristian love of money. It's the obsession with money. The love of money, that is the root of all sorts of evil. And what are, the, what are the evils that come with loving money? You look at people, and they're greedy. They're selfish. They're self-centered. It's all about them. It's, it's about envy, and it's about lust. It's all about you know, what they can amass. It causes a breakdown in one's fellowship with God and others as well. And money sometimes is a great obstacle. It's a barrier between you and God. And that's the biggest penalty. The Bible says you cannot serve two masters. For either you'll love the one, money, and hate the other, or you will despise one and love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. And that's where we, what we face. If you continue to be covetous, you will face the penalty. And the penalty is, it says there, wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This is so sad. Can you imagine? You're a Christian, and you're walking with the Lord. You're committed to Him. But one day, you find yourself being blessed with so much money. What happens? Some people don't know how to handle it. The attitude of their heart causes them to fall away. They wander. It's like they walk away from the faith. I have a dear friend who, who inherited money because his parents passed away. And he was quite young. He was young in his marriage. But he had all this money. He did not know what to do with it. You know what he ended up doing? He ended up going out with some, some friends, and they went barcada, they started drinking, they did crazy things to the point where he even had a mistress. He got a house for her, he got a car, he set her up in a village, and, and he lived a double life. And this went on for four years. His wife found out. How she found out, I don't know. But when she found out, she went to that house, and she was able to enter that house. And when she gets into the house, she looks around, and she was amazed. She looked and she saw pictures of her husband with this woman in all different situations. Like, 
Who is this man I'm married to? He was living another life. He wandered away from his marriage. He wandered away from God. He wandered to the point where he was lost. And that's what money did to him. It was so sad. Their marriage just broke apart. I'll tell you another true story. A man in the U.S., his name is Romeo Silerio. He won $6.9 million in the Virginia USA lottery in 1997. Would you like to have $6.9 million? I'm with you. I would love that, right? What would you do with it? This man gave up his warehousing job. He told his wife to quit her job also. So they both moved down to Florida from Virginia, moved to Florida. They bought a big house. They bought cars. They have one daughter, and they continued living there. But you know, because of this money, they got so engrossed in, in things, in material things, their relationship, unfortunately, started to crumble. It came to the point that they said, let's, let's just part ways. Let's divide up the money we have and go our separate ways. But when he did that, he said, I wish I hadn't won the lottery because his life was ruined. He was even jailed for two years. Why? Because he did not pay the alimony, the spousal support for his wife and kid of $250,000. Can you imagine? He didn't even have that anymore. 6.9 is what he, what he won. He split half with his wife. He didn't have $250,000 to, to pay his wife alimony. He went to jail for that. And in the end, he says, the money broke up my marriage and the money ruined my life. It's so dangerous. We could, we could want that money, but yet, how would you handle it? How is the attitude of your heart if you were to win that? In Psalm 112, verse 10, it says there, the covetous person is what? Miserable through and through. Constantly miserable, constantly miserable. You see, God wants you and me to be rich towards Him. To be rich towards Him. You might be interested to know, to know that Michael Jordan, you know Michael Jordan? One of the greatest basketball players who ever lived. He was earning such a huge contract to play basketball. He was earning millions of dollars. Someone computed. If he took that total amount of, of his yearly contract and divided by the number of basketball games he played in a year. He would earn about $300,000 per game. Can you imagine? And if you further divide that into a minute, he would earn $10,000 a minute. I mean, sometimes he's sitting on the bench doing nothing, right? And he's still earning $10,000. That's $10,000. That's only half a million pesos for us. A minute. Half a million pesos a minute. But the fact is, they also looked at his, his income and they realized that Michael Jordan earned more money than all the presidents of the United States in the past history combined in one year. He earned more than them in this one year. You think that's a lot? It's nothing compared to Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft. Nothing compared to Bill Gates. Someone said, if Michael Jordan wanted to be equal to Bill Gates, Michael Jordan would have to play for 270 years basketball without spending a single cent, not spending it in order to be equal to Bill Gates. What a perspective, huh? And yet, if they combined both their incomes, if they combined all their money together, all that money would not make a difference. If they had a child, a spouse, or even themselves sick with the terminal illness, an incurable disease, all that money would make no difference to their lives. And that was proven by Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. Pancreatitis, cancer. He had all the money and yet he could not do anything about his health. Friends, a day will come when you and I will stand before God. And can I tell you, he will not ask you, he will not ask you, how much money did you make? He's not going to ask you that. But the question is why? We need to ask ourselves the question, why? Why are we striving so much? Why are we trying to obtain and, and accumulate and amass so much? Why are we working 12 hours a day? Why are we trying to get everything? Why are we doing this? In Mark chapter 8, verse 36, it says, What good is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? And what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Your soul is so, so precious. Don't take your soul for granted. Your soul is more precious than all the money, all the riches that you can ever earn. All the status, all the image, that's nothing compared to your soul. Where will your soul end up? That's the question. Are you working on your soul or are you working on your 
savings account. The happiest people do not necessarily have the best things, but they appreciate the things that they have. Let me say that again. The happiest people are not necessarily those who have the best things, but they're the people who appreciate the things that they have. So, based on the penalty of covetitis, what's the prescription? Is there a way out? Is there a way out of this? I believe there is. And I thank God that He gives us the secret to getting out of covetousness. Well, let's look at point number three, the prescription of covetitis. The prescription of covetitis. What's the title of our message? Be content. And there's the answer. The answer to covetitis is be content. It's contentment. Can you all say contentment? Contentment. Friends, you cannot be content and covetous at the same time. Do you realize that? There's no way you can do those two things at the same time. What is contentment? What is contentment? Oh, I love this definition. It's an inner sense of rest and peace that comes from being in a right from being right with God. An inner sense of rest and peace from being right with God. It's not about who has what, wanting this and that. It's really, it's all about you. You and God, that's what it's all about. Why do we say this? Why do we say it's this inner sense of peace? It's because, friends, He gives us satisfaction with what we have. He gives us satisfaction with who we are. He gives us satisfaction with where we're going. It's all about God. It's all about God. Friends, without contentment, there will always be contention. There will always be that wrestling, that, that war that's going on in your life, that, that dispute, that dis- disagreement in your body. It's going to go on and on if you don't have contentment. You won't have that peace. You won't have that rest. It'll always be, I want more. I can't stand this life. I, I'm not happy. The Apostle Paul, he gave us the prescription for covetitis. He says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, let's, let's read this together. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. You see what Paul is saying? First of all, he's saying he learned it. It's not something that's automatic. You can't just pray, Lord, make me content, and all of a sudden you're content. No, it doesn't work that way. You don't just wake up in the morning, and all of a sudden you're content. It's not an instantaneous thing that happens. Friends, it's a process. Can you all say process? It's a process. It's a process of walking daily with God, walking intimately with, intimately with Him, and through that, that relationship, you will discover how to find contentment through Him. Paul says here, I have learned to be content in whatever the circumstance. What circumstance are you in today? Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. Do you know what it is to be in need? Are you in need today? He knew what it was to be poor, to have nothing. And he says, I know what it is to have plenty. He knew the exact opposite, to have a lot, abundance. And he says again, I have learned, second time, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Friends, contentment is learning to live in any situation. The thing here is oftentimes when you're in need, you're in need, what happens is we set God aside. Why? Because we're so worried about how to meet that need. And so we're focused, anxious about this need. How can I meet this need? God is not in the picture. The same thing, when we're, we're in plenty, we're in abundance, we have so much, God, I don't even need you. I'm I'm self-sufficient. I have everything I want. Lord, stay away. In both need and plenty, we can be in a dangerous position of not wanting God in our lives. But the secret of Paul is, he says here, he says in, in verse 13, I can do all this through what? Through Him who gives me strength. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. This is a verse that many of you have memorized. Yes or no? We've all, we, we love this verse. But the problem, friends, is that we use this verse out of context. We take this verse and we misinterpret it. We misuse it. We abuse it. We use this verse as if we are, we're empowered. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not our power. We have no power. 
We cannot change our circumstances at times. We have to live with our circumstances. So what does this mean? What is the real meaning of this verse? Friends, when you are in a situation or a circumstance, there are times that you cannot change it for whatever reason. But in the midst of that circumstance and situation, you can do all things. You can be content. Why? Because of Him who strengthens you. That's the secret. The secret is it's relying on God's power in order to be content in the midst of circumstances you can't change. Do you see that? I love God for the way He is, how He puts things in our lives. We might not be able to change the circumstance, but we have a God who can help us in the midst of our circumstance. Whether it's plenty or whether it's in need, He gives us contentment through His strength. Here was Paul who was in prison. His life was on the edge. He could die any time. He didn't know what day he was going to die, but he, could, he was on death row. And yet, he says, I'm filled with joy. I have, I have this special joy, this satisfaction, this steadfast love with God. Why? Because he gives me the strength, the strength to go on every day, no matter how impossible the circumstance might seem. Where are you today? Because wherever you are, you can find contentment through him who gives you strength through Christ who gives you strength biblical contentment is being satisfied with God can you all say that biblical contentment is being satisfied with God the bottom line is contentment is trusting God it's trusting God it's trusting that God knows what you need and trusting God to be faithful to fulfill his promise to give you what you need based on his knowledge not telling God, this is what I need. Lord, you know what I need. You know what's best for me. I'll trust you to give me that at the proper time. I'm not going to go ahead of you. I'm not going to run ahead of you or, or set you aside. I'm going to trust you every single way. Contentment lives with a view of eternity. That's one of the prescriptions. The contentment lives with a view of eternity. Can you all say that? Contentment lives with a view of eternity. Imagine, if you will, just for a minute, okay, that the Philippine economy is going to one day, we're told, one day going to switch from pesos to dollars. All of a sudden, that day will come when everything you own that's pesos is going to be worthless. Everything's going to be now dollars. The problem is we don't know when that switch will happen. We don't know when that day will happen. And so what do you do? If you're smart, what you'll do is you'll take your pesos and convert it into, into dollars today and live on just whatever you need for just the time that you think the switch will happen. But you'll make sure that you don't have any pesos left because you want to make sure you have dollars for the future. You know that that day is going to come. And the day that it'll come is when you die. Because everything you own today will be worthless. But what you exchange for the future in heaven, that's what will last. You and I must live on, on what we can today. But realize that what we send ahead, what we invest in the future, that's what will matter. That's what will matter our culture and media today does such a great job of enticing us, of giving us unfulfilled dreams so that we want to gratify ourselves today rather than tomorrow. Is that right? We're so tempted to, to buy things and to, to live on, on credit and debt, etc. And this is what advertisers do. We have to realize that life is very brief. It's so brief. I want to illustrate this for you. If I had a, if I had a rope, I could show you. If I could have a rope. Oh, perfect. Look at this. Okay, there's a rope here, huh? How nice and convenient. Friends, this rope, this rope is long. This is a very long rope. It's connected all the way to the ground floor, okay? And then it's connected all the way to ATC. Believe me, it's all the way to ATC. And from ATC, it's connected to Makati. And Makati all the way to Banawe. Banawe right there, so it's not Banawe. Right? And then it's connected all the way to Hong Kong and around the world, around the world many, many times. This rope is very, very long. Imagine that this rope, okay? This rope extends to eternity. All the, can you all say eternity? Yes. Etern this rope extends all the way to eternity. This rope also symbolizes your life's existence. This is your life's existence. Every one of us has a rope. This is like my life or your life, okay? And it goes all the way, all the way. Wow, this, this is a long rope. This, this rope goes all the way. Look at that. Huh? All the way. And you know what's happening? Friends, today, you and I, sadly are living in this time. 
this time here, this represents the day you're born and the day you die. The day you're born and the day you die. And we're focused on, on just living at this moment. How many years is that? I don't know. For some of us, it's, it's 80, 90 years. For some of us, it could be less. We don't know what could happen to us. But what do we do? In our minds, we're saying, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to study. I'm going to really save and invest my money so that I can, I can buy a house, get married. I can, I can you know, start saving for my retirement. I can um, invest money. And then I can finally retire and travel around the world and do many things and enjoy life. And, and then I'll die. That's it. That's how many people think. And then I'll die. That's it. Hello, what about all this? What about all this? We're thinking about just here. Friends, this is not the end of your life. This is just the beginning. And from here to here, friends, this is what determines all of this. We take it for granted. We think, I just live for the, I'll live for the time. I'll just enjoy life. I'll make sure that I, I'm a good person. I help other people. But it's only up to here. Friends, this moment, this moment here, that's when you see Jesus face to face. That's what they call the finish line. Do you realize that? Everything you do from the time you're born till the time you die determines where you'll spend eternity. The apostle Paul says, I will. He looked at the Christian life as a race, as a marathon. He says, I'm running the race, and I'm straining, I'm striving, I'm going to reach that finish line. And he was focused on the finish line. I'm going to strain forward to reach that line, and I don't care what's behind me. I'm going to keep on going. So many of us look behind and say, what do people think of me? What do people, what's their impression of me? What's my reputation with us? That's not important. It's the future. It's face-to-face -face time with Jesus. You know, people say, Joby, you're so crazy. Why did you give up a, a great, luxurious job and, and lifestyle and you can travel around the world? You became a pastor. You, came, you have such a simple life. I said, yeah, but you know, friend, I'm living for eternity. I'm not living for the here and now. I, I, I want to do what I do because I want to please God. And so you have to realize that your existence on this earth is not just from here to here, but it's all of this. What's going to happen to all of this? Remember that our momentary life here on this earth is nothing, nothing compared to everything that is beyond our life here. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. What a mess of life, huh? Friends, we must focus on laying up treasures where? In heaven. In heaven. Gaining an eternal perspective is what's key. Eternal values. Look at your life, and, and you should make choices based on how will this affect my eternity. How will this affect my eternity? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it says there, Now godliness with contentment. Notice, godliness with contentment. What a great combination. It says, is great gain. It's great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry what? We can carry nothing with us. You can't carry out all the stuff with you to wherever you go when you die. No, it stays behind. So even that perspective, let's wake up. That perspective of things stay behind, if you, if you really embrace that truth, what are you living for? What are you living for? You can't take it with you. Friend, contentment is more a matter of perspective than circumstance. It's more a matter of perspective than circumstance. What are you looking for? Where are you focused today? So many people are focused on Facebook, and they look at what other people are doing, what other people are eating, where they're going, where they're traveling. They look at their families, all these wonderful pictures, you know, and they're saying, wow, why is my life not like that? Why can't I go there? Why can't I have that? Why can't I do this? And you know what happens? We're comparing so much that inside it's, it's eating us. It's becoming a, a, an obsession. We're envious with these people. We're not saying it out loud, but deep inside we're unsatisfied. So don't compare Guard your eyes, guard your heart from comparing what you have with others. If you're looking to Christ, you will be content. Look to Christ. Look to see what He has given you. What has He given you? Contentment lives with a heart of generosity. Can you all say that? Contentment lives with a heart of generosity. First, contentment lives with a view of eternity, and now contentment lives with a heart of generosity. You see, friends, the greatest enemy of covetousness is the greatest, and the number one enemy of, of generosity is covetousness. You cannot be a giver and a taker at the same time. Are you generous or are you stingy or selfish? In Tagalog, are you mapagbigay or are you kuriput? What are you? Uh, 
Mark Batterson said this. He said, when God blesses you richly, it's not to increase your standard of living, but it's what? It's to increase your standard of giving. You see our fault? And this is what happens to many of us. We receive a, a higher salary. We receive a greater income. We increase our standard of living rather than our standard of giving. We are meant to be channels of blessings, instruments of God to, to bless others. But what happens is we become containers. We hold it back to keep it to ourselves. God blessed us to be a blessing to others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, let's read this. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. God wants to enrich your life. He wants to allow you to experience blessings so that you can bless others. Now, think of this scenario. Think about you giving a great donation to a charity, to a, a foundation. Say, for example, feed the children, okay? You want to help create a world where there's no child who goes hungry. You gave a big amount of your income to that organization. And then you found out that 90% of what you gave was set aside and put into the pocket of the CEO. How would you feel? How would you feel? Wouldn't you be outraged? Wouldn't you be mad and angry and, and feel betrayed? How could this guy do I mean, I entrusted this money to him and he's now using it for his own purposes? That's not right. That's not right. Well, you see, friends, we are all CEOs, just like that man. We are all nonprofit organizations, and God has made donations into our life. He's made donations into our bank accounts for us to use for missions, for us to use for His mission. In whatever we do, we should use it not for our own luxury, but use it for, for Him. It doesn't belong to us. We can enjoy it, certainly, no problem there, but, but are we also being generous with others? Think about this, friends. You and I don't own what we have today. It all belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. But how you use it is what's important. God looks at your heart when it comes to how you use His blessings. You can never be a giver and taker at the same time. And nothing cures greed like a truly generous heart. I say this not because I want you to give money to CCF, because that's the last thing I want you to even think about. I don't want to make you guilty. CCF is so blessed because so many of you, so many of you understand how it is to, to give to God, to worship God, to, to be a privilege to, to serve God. And, and this is not about giving money always. It's about giving your life, giving your time, giving your energy, giving your resources to others. First and foremost, in your own family, are you making sure you're generous with your time to your wife and your children? Are you, are you giving of yourself when it comes to your time in your D group? in giving spiritual guidance to others who are lost? Are you giving generously to people who, who need to know the gospel? Are you generous in all those areas? In Matthew chapter 6, 21, it says there, for where your treasure is, what? There will your heart be also. If your treasure is in the world, where's your heart? It's in the world. If you join the stock market and you, you put money in the stock market, what'll happen? Every day you're going to be looking in the stocks. Why? Because your heart is now in the stock market. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is in this world, that's where it will be, in this world. The irony of all this is that sometimes when you try to keep your money, the more you want to protect your money, the more you, it tends to just go away. I don't know if that's happened to you. The more you try to cling onto your money, the more it seems to slip away. Martin Luther said this, he said, I have held many things in my hands, and I've lost them all. But whatever I've placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Look at that. He's saying here that when you give to God, God multiplies it. God multiplies it. And to me, we have to realize that God is the most generous person there is. God gave His only begotten Son, His most precious Son. He gave His Son for us. We who don't deserve His Son. His Son came to this earth, lived a sinless life. And then at the appointed time, He died. He became a sacrifice to pay for the sins of mankind. Jesus, who was sinless, became the victim, became the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. Our God is a generous God. He doesn't just tell us to be generous. He Himself 
is the one who's generous. So remember, what's the prescription of covetousness? Contentment lives with a view of eternity. And contentment lives with a heart of generosity. Where are you today in all this? Where are you today? Are you living your life for eternity? Or are you living your life for the here and now? Things that are temporal, things that are passing away, things that will not last. Or are you living your life for eternity, things that will last forever? Your soul and the soul of man is what's going to last forever. Make sure you put your heart into that. Now, friends, I'll tell you the story about Moses. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 26, it says there, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. You know, this verse is amazing. It sums up what we've been talking about this whole evening. Here's Moses. If you remember the story, at the time Pharaoh made a proclamation for all the children, two years old and below, male, to be killed. To be killed. And so what happened? The mother of Moses put Moses in a basket as a baby and put him down the river. And Pharaoh's daughter happened to catch and, and keep Moses. And she raised Moses as her adopted son. So Moses grew up in, in luxury. He grew up in the palace. He grew up as, as one of Pharaoh's heirs. Can you imagine living in, in the palace, the royal palace of Pharaoh, with everything? But he learned one day that he was not really the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He learned that he was adopted. He learned that his real mother was a Jewish Hebrew slave. And so this verse tells us here, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but choosing, he made a choice rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God. He knew that that choice that he would make to go back to his real heritage as a Jew would mean that he'd be a slave. He would go... He would experience suffering. He would experience pain, the treatment that, that the Egyptians had for the Jews, for the slaves. But he chose that. He gave his life generously because he felt he could do something much better with being a, a Jew and a slave rather than being a rich young son in, in Pharaoh's palace. It says there, he chose that rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Those passing pleasures are what he experienced in, in the palace of, of the Pharaoh. All those riches, all those pleasures were just passing. They're all temporal. Moses had the right perspective. He viewed his life in terms of eternity. And then the next verse says, considering, he considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. There's no comparison between what Egypt could give him as far as riches and treasure compared to what Christ could give him. He knew Christ's riches were far far better in comparison. It says there, for he was looking to the reward. Moses had a view of eternity. He made a choice in his time, and that choice would encounter suffering, would encounter ill treatment, but he knew that if he chose to stay in the palace, it would be meaningless. He looked forward to the reward of what God had in store for him. What about us? What about us? If you and I will focus on the things of this earth we're just going to be lost. And all these things are just passing away. Let's focus on what's real, and that's eternity. Our life with God forever. That's where the real eternal riches are. There was a song that was composed by a lady by the name of Helen Lemuel in 1922. And this song was entitled, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. Continue. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And that says it all. Friends, when you turn your eyes on Jesus, when you look to Jesus, you will find satisfaction. He has given you the greatest gift of all, and that's the gift of salvation. Don't take that gift for granted. People these days, they cannot give you anything in comparison to what God has already given you. So beware of covetitis, be content. Biblical contentment is being satisfied with God. My prayer is that you would walk in confidence and enjoy the peace and the joy and the happiness that God gives you through Jesus Christ. Let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious, loving God, 
We stand amazed at your wisdom, at your guidance, letting us know that we can wander away from our faith if we allow riches to capture our hearts. May we allow our hearts to be captured by Jesus and Him alone. Our prayer, Lord God, is that you would allow each and every one of us here to have an intimate relationship with you so we will be so satisfied with you that it would bring us inner rest and peace that comes from you alone. Thank you, Lord, that it's through you that we can find contentment because you give us contentment in the midst of whatever circumstance we're in, even if it's impossible. Thank you, Lord, that we have enough. Christ is enough. The world's things are passing away, but what Christ gives us is enough. Father, I pray for those individuals who are here tonight, and maybe, friend, you're here tonight, and God has spoken to your heart, and God has been telling you to be part of his family. He wants you to give your life to him. If you've never surrendered your life, if you've never given your life to Christ, do that right now. Make this that special evening for you. I want to lead you in a prayer, but make this prayer your prayer with God. Make this prayer come from your heart to Him. Say to Him, Lord God, I need you. There is nothing that this world can offer that can compare to you. Tonight, Lord, I realize that my soul is the most important thing, and I want my soul to be right with you. I thank you for loving me unconditionally, for sending your one and only son, Jesus, to die and become the sacrifice to pay for my sins. Today, right now, I open my heart to you and I commit my life. I surrender my life to you. Take me as I am, Lord. Change me from the inside out and make me the person that you want me to be. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your patience and love for me. I know, Lord God, that you will do great and mighty things in and through my life. Use me, Lord, for your glory. Thank you, Father, that you give me a brand new start. And I pray for everyone here, Lord, that we would live a life that is an example of contentment so that our family, our children will know what contentment is, so that our friends will see that we have contentment, trust in you, Lord, in all that we do. We cannot thank you enough for all that you're doing in and through our lives. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And we pray this in Jesus' most precious name. And everyone says, amen and amen. Glory be to God. I love you guys.